Hello, everyone. My name is Chang Sun, and welcome to Women Data Science 2022 Mastery Conference Video Series. On March 8, 2022, thousands of participants gathered around the globe for the Women Data Science Worldwide Conference. The Mastery Conference featured keynotes, technical talks, panel discussions, and many more interesting things. In this video, Dr. Mirella Popa, an assistant professor at Maastricht University, as the host of WIS Maastricht Conference 2022, introduces our speaker, Dr. Katerina Stankova. Dr. Stankova talked about the topic of improving cancer treatment through game theory. If you're interested in this talk, please keep watching. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Katerina Stankova. She's associate professor at Dirt University of Technology. Uh, and before that, she was uh, here with us at Maastricht University uh, doing research in game theory for cancer treatment. She's leading a lot of projects, national, international ones, um, supported by the Netherlands Research Organization. She also received a um, Stairway to Impact Prize for designing novel cancer therapies. So we are really looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to see you all. My, also a lot of my past colleagues. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to talk about, see, just clicking for it, um, is uh, basically how can we use game theory to improve treatment of cancers with focus specifically on cancers which are a little bit more advanced or wide advanced actually very often. So I talk about metastatic cancers as cancers which were actually the cancer cells already left their original site and they moved to some other sites in the body which we call them metastatic cancers. And then uh, to motivate what I'm going to talk about, uh, I would like to review the current standard of care protocol in metastatic cancers and uh, what it is about. Typically, <laughs> you basically select the drug, the drug which you might base on a certain screening or certain properties of the cancer or your patient. Uh, and typically, then you apply it at the so-called maximum tolerated dose, which is the maximum amount which you can give to the patient without, which is believed that will be still not harming them um, too much through the side effects. And then you do it either continuously or you do it in the repeated identical cycles because you want to give patients some break from the toxicity of the drug. Then uh, what you do, whatever you measure, uh, it might be based on imaging or it might be based on biomarkers, uh, you uh, are interested in the proxy of the tumor volume. And if you think that the tumor volume goes down, then you continue giving this drug. And you continue with that until there is either unacceptable toxicity uh, or uh, there is an uh, unambiguous evidence of tumor progression. Maybe in this picture you miss cure, <laughs> but that is possible. But in this type of really advanced cancers, this is very rare. Okay? And if you think about this, so, so what is interesting about this is uh, in the past, say, 50 years, we got much better in the cancer prevention and you know, we live healthier, we smoke less, we move more. We got much better in actually treating early stages of cancers. But when it comes to the metastatic, uh, so the more advanced stages in some cancers, we are about the same as 50 years ago. And for uh, say metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer about which I will uh, talk a bit today, uh, there we are even worse than we were 50 years ago. So what is really the problem? So uh, I think that the idea is, okay, I want to kill these cancer cells. I want to kill them as fast as possible, with as much dose as possible. But perhaps what we are sort of ignoring is that it's not just the same cancer cells, that they are very diverse. They have uh, different response mechanisms to this treatment. And this diversity is then sourced to maybe uh, learning how to actually react to this drug and become more resistant to it. So. Um, and that's why maybe this kind of protocol is not problematic because of the choice of the best drug, but it's probably problematic because of the lack of tactics. 
Okay, so we choose the drug and we take as, give as much as we can until we see it doesn't work and then we switch and we do it over and over again until the tumor doesn't respond. So what will be outline of my talk, I will talk just in one slide about what I do in my research. Then I will talk briefly about game theory uh, of cancer and its treatment. And um, then uh, I will talk about the data because it, I think should be prominently in this talk. <laughs> and what is so-called evolutionary therapy, which is an improved way how to treat these, especially these advanced cancers. And then I will conclude with some uh, future steps and maybe projects we are working on now. So just to um, show the problem again. So initially, if you apply, so here it is the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but doesn't matter if you apply the treatment, you see initial response, but earlier or later you see that actually uh, the tumor somehow learns, and we will see why, <laughs> and how to, how to deal with this drug, and then it starts growing again, okay? And maybe that is something we don't take into account that this uh, protocol, which I was showing you before. Uh, so what I work on is dynamic game theory, which you could see as a mathematical theory of interactions. And I'm not going to give you a lecture on game theory, don't worry. <laughs> but I just wanted to say that there is a classical game theory, which really is focusing on um, how to analyze situations when you have rational uh, parties, which have different strategies, and, uh, for, uh, and actually outcomes of these situations lead to uh, profits, which may also depend on the choices of the others. Then we have evolutionary game theory, which could be seen more as a Darwinian a mathematical theory of Darwinian evolution. So uh, these strategies are not anymore chosen. So cancer cells do not choose to be more or less resistant. But uh, if you are resistant, you survive with this treatment. So uh, you do not choose your strategy, but you likely inherit it maybe from your parents. Uh, if this is a good strategy to survive. Um, and then uh, the question which I have in my research is how can a rational player, if it is added to this game uh, where you have evolutionary players, how can I actually influence the system to do what I would like it to do? Yeah, so if it is, for example, um, something living which I like to sustain, how should I do it? Yeah, but if it is cancer, on the other hand, maybe I would like to kill it. So how should I do this? And uh, that's what we call now Stackelberg evolutionary games. So the games which have like this kind of uh, uh, smart leader, <laughs> but the followers are not necessarily smart. So how can we really combine these two theories together? And then basically the main question is, if I have a rational leader, like a physician who enters this game with sort of evolutionary players like cancer cells, what would be the best way to use the tactics to actually drive the system to the state I would want to have it in. Uh, and um, in this talk, I will uh, talk about uh, uh, a lot of results maybe, uh, which are of course not only my results, but also results uh, of collaborations with many brilliant uh, scientists I work with. And I said here, young, <laughs> but uh, young, I think is more a state of mind. So I just wanted to show the diversity. Some of them are at Maastricht University, some of them are at Tudelt, and some of them are at Muffet Cancer Center. And some of them are indeed uh, by their spirit younger <laughs> than uh, some of the 20 years old. And uh, so uh, the results which I will show, uh, sometimes I will have their picture on the slides uh, is of course, uh, those are based on this joint work, so it's not only me who worked on it. Uh, so I will start with game theory uh, of cancer and its treatment. Uh, very shortly, don't worry. <laughs> so in, uh, if you want to, if you, any situations in which you have players, their strategies and their payoffs can be defined as a game. So uh, in the classical game, the players can be just players, but it can be also you and me. And I'm trying to give you some information because I think you should all do game theory and maybe your objective is completely different. <laughs> so your, my payoff is how many people will now contact me that they want to join my projects maybe, and your payoff is, um, yeah, I don't know, how to have mo most fun of this event, for example, or learn as much as possible about different topics. Uh, in evolutionary world, uh, we have cancer cells, which are, the, which are the players. Their strategies are not really chosen, but indeed inherited, so to speak, heritable traits. And um, in some uh, cancers, you even see them. You can see visibly the different strategies which they are using. So those are, for example, ovarian cancers. 
uh, ovarian cancer cells. And you see that these ones, which look like pillows, those are the ones which actually are inside of the ovary. And the ones which have these really strange shapes at the sides, those are the invasive ones. Those are the ones who really invade um, through the gap between ovary and your fallopian tube. They basically invade into, into, into the perineum. And uh, you see that they, they, they sort of look a bit scary. They almost look like they have legs and they are sort of, in, you know, uh, so, so depending on what they do, they evolve for this action, right? So if I treat them, uh, probably they will re react differently than these cells than if they are these cells. Mm -hmm. And then here we don't talk really about money, they are not gaining money or they are not gaining how many <laughs> students they should get, but it's all about their proliferation and survival, which we call fitness. So those which are more fit will survive, other will die. If you choose a bad strategy, so you don't even choose it, but if there comes a mutation which brings you strategy which is not smart, you are going to not survive on the long run. Uh, and so there are probably many people who stated this already quite a while ago, that cancer is an evolutionary game and we should really treat it as such. So this is one of the, uh, one of the authors who actually mentioned that. Uh, and then I want to just briefly tell you a little bit about mathematics, but not too much, okay? So uh, in the previous talk uh, or two talks before, uh, we saw like a logistic growth uh, or logistic uh, regression. So problem of the logistic regression in cancer is that it can only match the monotonic uh, increase or monotonic decrease, yeah? So the simplest models which we are using actually don't have just one equation like a logistic growth, but we have a growth or decay of the sensitive cells and of the resistant cells. Those are, and what matters here is this resistance is with respect to the treatment which I choose. Yeah, so if I have one treatment, you can be a sensitive cell or you can be resistant cells. And then they will have different dynamics depending on whether they are sensitive or resistant. And uh, the, this difference might be that the resistant cells uh, in this expression can actually evolve uh, something which we call this, this property of the resistance which will sort of harm the effect of the treatment, okay? And now, of course, I can show you any models, but if they are not fitted well with the data, then maybe you will not believe me, but that I will cover as well in a while. So, uh, and basically already with this very simple model, we see that if we would have just a situation with sensitive being the um, very um, almost whitish cells and resistant being the darker cells, if I apply the maximum tolerable dose uh, in these models, I see that I'm basically killing those which are sensitive because uh, they somehow uh, not evolve, they do not really respond to it by, by higher resistance. And what I will end up at the later stage, I will end up with the cells which are fully resistant. Now, if I have, for example, more treatment, then I can sort of, so in this situation, what would be maybe smarter and what I will uh, lead this talk to is not to use as much treatment as I want, because uh, if I use less, so sort of adaptive dose of the treatment, and I will leave there uh, some causes in the sort of strategic times to the treatment, not at a priori decided, but dependent on what type of uh, treatment, uh, what type of tumor volume I have, then I will sort of be able to not kill all the, sen all the sensitive cells. And those sensitive cells will then basically keep the tumor under check in the periods when I don't treat. So if your goal is to keep the patient alive, then it would not be maybe so good to apply maximum tolerable dose all the time, but maybe it would be better to uh, be a little bit more strategic. Yeah, so there should be times when you apply it, you should apply less, uh, etc. If you have uh, more drugs, then there will be not two types of cells, even in the simple model, but there will be four, right? So there will be those which are sensitive to both drugs, sensitive to resistant to both drugs or all the options. And then uh, sometimes we don't really know uh, whether they are like fully sensitive and fully resistant cells because this resistance evolves sort of on the go. Uh, then basically it looks something like this, right? So in the beginning, you have sort of initially all sensitive cells. And then uh, as you apply maximum tolerable dose, then they are becoming more and more resistant until you basically end up with a completely resistant tumor. Here, uh, if you would not do that, if you would basically give them sort of time without the treatment at the strategic moment, then basically you could also see that it's not really, you know, it would not be, a good idea for them to stay resistant because uh, then uh, there is no reason why they should resist. And as a consequence, you can control the system for a longer time, yeah? So that would be one option. Interesting is that, for example, if you look on 
Uh, this situation, tumor volume, this is probably similar tumor volume as this one, but this is much worse because the tumor is much more resistant, but that's not what we measure because what we measure is just the tumor volume. We don't really measure the property of this uh, of the cells which we are trying to treat, to kill, actually. And so that brings us to the next part, and that is, okay, so if I now include the smart physician <laughs> to this game, so I have this game of cancer cells, and the physician can choose to choose different treatments, their timing, dosing, combinations, and the cancer cells is evolving, so the cancer cells are evolving, so respond in terms of their, not only their size, but also their evolutionary dynamics, meaning their composition. Uh, what would be the best? to do in this game. So uh, in this game between the cancer cells and the physician, I have that the physician chooses the therapy options and cancer cells sort of uh, respond, adjust to it. And of course, if my goal is to keep the patient alive for as long as possible, uh, then I will choose a different strategy than if I just want to kill as many cancer cells as possible at this moment. Yeah, so that's a different objective. Um, okay. And uh, to, on the positive side, there are two critical asymmetries which actually make a physician much stronger in this game than the cancer cells. One is only the physician is rational. And the other one, uh, the cancer cells cannot really sort of estimate what type of treatments are going to come, right? So uh, if we are able to predict well enough what is the response of cancer cells to the treatment which I want to give, uh, then I should really use this advantage. And uh, the physician should really use these advantages and should not just apply the same dose all over again until it doesn't work. So uh, what uh, we see uh, in a model uh, of uh, by chance metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, so that's also a connection with the previous uh, talk. So here, uh, this was modeled by a model with three cell types because there is a, there are two different types of resistance in the cell. And we are actually having in the first row uh, the dose of the treatment. So uh, you see that uh, if it is one, that means you apply maximum tolerable dose. If it would be zero, then you apply none. So here we simulate the maximum tolerable dose. And in the bottom row, uh, we actually see for different type of patients. So that depends on uh, how, uh, how uh, what was the proportion of these resistant cells in the beginning. How do they respond to this to this treatment? So there is only um, so here we see volume of different types of cancer cells. Well, the red one is the one which we try to target. So that's the one which is sensitive towards this treatment called abiraterone. So you see, only if the patient is a best responder, meaning it did not have any, they did not have any resistant cells, and they did not evolve in response to this treatment, I can control the tumor. In all other cases, I will basically end up with a with a tumor which evolves into complete resistance. And uh, what I actually managed by this strategy, which I call a lame, <laughs> is I have trained the best enemy I could, I could train because this tumor I cannot control with my treatment anymore and I have to try something else. And then I do it over and over again. So this is not really smart, is it? And uh, of course, uh, for those who sort of believe that uh, there is an idea to cure these patients, these are images of these patients so you see all these black dots are their metastasis. So the idea that actually you are going to kill them all, all these cancer cells is really, really naive. Yeah? So perhaps here we should really attempt to see, can we keep them under control uh, with a good quality of life for as long as possible, meaning they will maybe die of, I don't know what, when they are hundred years old. Yeah, so what is really the treatment goal here is also a very big question, okay? Uh, so then we bring this idea to, of evolutionary therapy to this uh, presentation. So evolutionary therapy is really a therapy that sort of tries to anticipate uh, what will be the response in cancer cells to my treatment and then take it strategically into account. Uh, and typically how we do it is that we first uh, make a mathematical model of what's going on. We fit it with the data, we validate it through additional data. And then uh, once we believe that the model describes the reality well, then we can uh, try to find a protocol which will work for all possible parameterizations for these models, such that uh, for all types of patients, we will see a better treatment outcome. Okay. So in the standard of care, we sort of observe what's happening and then I do something. Here we try to anticipate and uh, sort of be the first player in this game, really take this leadership role. How much time I still have? I hope I did not get, uh, still 10 minutes? Yes? Okay, good. Uh, so, 
uh, then when we move to the data, uh, so we did uh, fitting of different types of data, or we typically now just try to combine different data sets. So for example, in this uh, project, which is um, a collaboration with the University, University Clinic Aachen, uh, we basically took uh, data from, um, there were initially 1500 patients, but then we sort of filtered out the patients which had not enough data points. Uh, and uh, so then we stayed with like 600 patients. And only thing which was actually measured in these trials was like tumor diameter. So basically what we know is only how the tumor diameter sort of changes over time. And then if we come back to these models, which uh, Rihanna, I think was talking about, um, they cannot at all capture, uh, so this is the real measurement, this type of resistance evolution, okay? So they cannot really um, capture the situation when the tumor first responds and then it grows because of evolution of resistance. So then we saw that basically if we include this uh, game theoretical thinking that really the system responds and uh, even if we have to guess what is basically rate of resistance, this is this graph, how the resistance grows, we are able to capture the uh, what is happening to these patients much better. Well, if you use the classical mathematical models which are used nowadays uh, very often, uh, then you can uh, predict only monotonic traits. So really strictly increasing, strictly decreasing. Uh, you cannot predict delayed response or this evolution of resistance, which is very typical. Okay, then uh, uh, we've tried to get better. Yeah, so this is a collaboration with Rachel Cavell from uh, Big E and uh, with a PhD student of mine, Veronica Gaska, uh, where we basically try to include towards the volumetric information, also omics data. Uh, at this moment, we mostly work on transcriptomics, but we are also expanding it to the, to the other uh, uh, directions. And basically, this is a sort of a smoothie uh, problem where basically uh, we get all these large data sets, which are sort of a mixture of different fruits. And we don't really know what fruits are in, <laughs> what are actually their, uh, their profiles and how these profiles change over time. So we know that there are different cancer cell types. We just don't know maybe often. Uh, what are their profiles and how do they respond to the treatment? So to actually figure out how to do this pro properly. So in some cases we know that we have um, we have like uh, strawberries and we have uh, sorry strawberries, raspberries, etc. Then we can use supervised methods. If we don't, we have to use like unsupervised machine learning methods to just actually uh, figure out how many types of these cells we have in and what are their profiles. Uh, so. Uh, in this project, we actually worked on the glioblastoma organoids, where we basically used first um, unsupervised and then also supervised methods from existing literature to actually figure out what are the different cell types. And we found out that uh, in response to radiotherapy uh, in non-small cell, um, sorry, this was, I think, in glioblastoma, but we also work on non-small cell lung cancer. So maybe I mixed up two different cancers at this moment, but the, that doesn't matter for the technique. So uh, there you can first identify what are the profiles of these cells, and then you can over time actually uh, check what are the responses in terms of their proportion in the mixture. And this was done then in uh, uh, patient-derived organoids, meaning you take a sample from the patient's tumors, and then you basically expose them to the same treatment as the patients get, and then you can actually observe what is happening uh, in these organoids. Uh, and uh, then basically uh, the belief is that this is a very good proxy of what is happening in the real patients so that can help you to actually adjust the dosing for these patients. Um, and then you can use actually the game theoretic modeling where you sort of predict what's going on to happen. And we are now in the validation stage so collecting more, more points to actually see whether uh, the predictions which we make, so those are actually which we expect if the tumor stabilized with the treatment are, but they really work. So we want to, we are adding this information to the volumetric information to not learn only about the tumor volume, but also uh, about the composition and how this composition changes over time. Uh, then uh, in other projects, we are actually using a single cell uh, sequencing methods where we actually get like spatial information. So here you see a spatial information on expression of different markers, but we don't really know um, which markers correspond to which cell types. So here, this is in uh, colon rectum cancer. Uh, and these are in real patients, so not in the organoids anymore. And we would want to actually figure out. So here we have again profiles of different cell types. We want to see how do they 
change these proportions of the different cell types over time so that we can use it in a better optimization of the treatment, okay? Uh, and then uh, that leads to like more spatial game theoretical models. So if you're interested in that, um, I will be happy to chat about it at some other time because I think I am a bit slower than I thought. And that brings me to this idea of evolutionary therapy. So, so far I told you why game theory is a good idea, <laughs> why standard of care is not such a good idea, and how do we use data? And now I want to show you some results. So the uh, evolutionary therapy is nowadays sort of working definition is a therapy which anticipates and first of all evolution of treatment induced resistance in cancer cells. Uh, and then we have been collaborating with the Moffitt Cancer Center who has the Center of Excellence for Evolutionary Therapy. And we have helped also with my past PhD candidate with modeling some of these cancers such that we can decide, decide really this kind of dynamic protocols which improve at the time, improve the quality of life and also time to progression of these patients. And here is Bob Gatenbay from Moffitt Cancer Center who is sort of named the father of this evolutionary of adaptive therapy. Uh, and so one of these protocols I want to show you, so that's in the metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, which I was showing you before on some graphs. Uh, so basically what you do first, uh, so prostate-specific antigen basically measures is a proxy of tumor volume. So for each single patient, you measure the initial uh, prostate-specific antigen value. And then you basically apply the treatment until you reach 50% of its initial size, and then you let the tumor regrow. And then you do it again and again and again. Uh, and you basically are checking how the tumor grows and you are trying to estimate what is the proportion of these sensitive and resistant cell types in this, uh, in this, in this cancer. Uh, so to compare the normal protocol, so this is a second line therapy. So, uh, so-called chemical castration, so removing testosterone from the blood did not work anymore. So we are optimizing uh, for like more advanced cancer than the one which actually Rihanna was talking about in her previous talk. So here, um, so in the standard of care, you apply everything at a maximum tolerable dose. Here we basically apply the treatment only until the tumor shrinks to about a half and then we stop treating and then we can apply the treatment and we stop treating. And you see, if you see the sample of the patients, so with the standard of care, you see this is treatment all the time, the red. And in the adaptive protocol, you see that every single patient, which is in this picture, has a different cycles on and off treatment, okay? And even if this was really sort of naive, why how? Why not three quarters? Because it seemed it would lead to time to progression, which is higher for all these patients and less toxicity because you treat less. So then you see that in this situation, only one of them progressed while here almost everybody progressed. Okay, so you are getting an individual protocol, which is different cycles treatment on and off. So if you would say, I decide this a priori, I would not be able to do that. Yeah, so this, this protocol is tuned to the state of the tumor for individual patient. Okay, but it's very easy. Therefore, it sort of is easy to also apply in a clinical practice. Okay, and then of course, I wanted also to talk about the difference between modeling and the reality, but I think I will skip this slide. I wanted to just show that even with this protocol, which is relatively simple, you basically got uh, on the classical therapy, you get like 13.8 months time to progression while on the adaptive therapy from the patient so far treated, you see 32.7, so between twice to three times more time until they progress on this protocol. And you see that they receive much less treatment. So they receive uh, on average 41% of the, of the dose. So they are actually feeling much better than the patients on the standard of care. And um, I was a bit naive about my speed. So I was skip some other adaptive therapy ideas. Uh, we are also, we have designed a trial design with Moffitt Cancer Center for uh, the thyroid cancer. So that we are trying to do something different with tyrosine, tyrosine, ty sorry. TKI, so, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, and currently we are also in the Netherlands starting um, design of evolutionary therapy for non-small cell lung cancer, where we are using again tyrosine kinase inhibitors together with chemotherapy. So the question is what would be the best sequence, timing and dosing of these different treatments? Because we see that for all patients, there is initial response, but early or later they actually uh, resistance evolve and the treatment doesn't work anymore. So how can we do this better? 
So how can we stabilize the disease or try to prolong the progression so long that, uh, you know, that it's so long that it's not uh, so dangerous for the patients anymore. Um, I think I speeded my pace very much at the end. So I come to conclusions. Um, so what are the take home messages? So I hope I managed to convince you that we should really see it as a leader follower game and we are the leaders, so we should use these advantages. Um, even simple evolutionary therapies, so the therapies which take this knowledge into account will prolong patients' lives and also their quality. And the future research, so we are developing now evolutionary therapies here in the Netherlands for together with the, with the clinicians actually for non-small cell lung cancer, but also head and neck cancer, like colorectal cancer. And I think that using better data and all these different data sources we are now getting should be all combined to get better models and that will lead to better therapies. Um, and uh, of course, we're also working on different projects where we are trying to see uh, under which conditions the sort of machine learning techniques predict uh, the response to the treatment in the same way or in a different way than game theoretical models and why, because the game theoretical models have this advantage that they are explainable. Yeah. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you for watching this WIS Conference 2022 video from Maastricht. And you're welcome to watch more conference videos from WIS Worldwide on YouTube.